What happens when the world gets turned on its head? We're forced to look inward, perhaps become fearful, sometimes lash out at others. While there are others in the world who don't give up hope because they believe in people. Join me, Kevin Tibbles and Amy Goldberg for our new podcast, Believe in People, where we meet those who don't give up hope. Today, we're going to challenge ourselves from the inside out. Do we really see and understand what's going on? Or are we only viewing things through the prism of our mind, what it tells us to see? Eric and Mar Olson work to solve large-scale global challenges by helping all of us change from within. And their organization is called One Solution Global. Eric and uh, Mara, welcome to Believe in People. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us. Um, guys, I'd like to first ask maybe Mara, um, why do you think so many of the answers come from within? Wow, he just straight in. Yeah, there. yeah. Was, there's no more. <laughs> there. no, no wasted time. <laughs> yes, I like that. Um, you know, I think it's something that life has shown me. Um, and yet, even though I've seen it a million times, it's always sort of beautiful and surprising and magical when I see it again. Um, but I have seen that it's a, a universal truth of, you know, kind of the intelligence that runs through all of life, whether it be plants or animals or humans, that, that nature has this amazing life force built into it. Um, that a piece of that for those of us that are humans and have minds and, and have this incredible creative capacity to think our way through lives, our lives, it's, it shows up as answers when we need them. It shows up as, um, kind of knowing what I need to do in order to be alive and to thrive. Um, and I think we can get really distracted from that. I think we can get really confused and things can get noisy and we can let a lot of external inputs um, overshadow that quieter, more fundamental truth. But man, when we have the opportunity to settle down, to look within, to reconnect to that intelligence, I find that invariably every human has the answers that they need inside themselves. And I think and, And Mara, to that point, and I'm just so inspired by you two, and there's so much to talk about, but with One Solution Global, you say, "When our I love this, when our minds change, we change the world. How? How do we do that? Do you want me to go first? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Well, I think the first step in doing that is considering that fact, in my opinion. so if you if you look at the world right now, and most people, we talk about things as if they are separate from us, and is as if they were already there um, before humans, and is as if they're not connected to us. We talk about systems, we talk about cultures, we talk about organizations, we talk about the state of the world, we talk about our families, our schools. And we don't consider how they came about in the first place. So the, the quickest way to help with that is actually just to talk about that fact and consider that fact because it's so new. It kind of stops, stops us in our tracks. It's like you really start to reflect on it like, hey, everything I see has, has come through humans, all these human created things have come and everything in my life, I'm a kind of a participant and I'm I'm a co-creator. So to me, the most powerful thing is first to just consider that statement and look at it a little bit, look in your life, look at at the world and, and just observe the uncontrollable craziness of thoughts plus humans over time have created 
like thousands of years of us having ideas and then putting them into the world. And then that thing in the world comes back at us. And we're like, oh, I don't like this. But what happened? We're like, oh, it, it first came from us. And now we're like, we don't like the effects of it. So I'm a big proponent of just talking about that. Like, I love talking about that fact. And then if, if people are fascinated by that, I like to talk about how, how that happens. How does that creation happen? How, how does all these separate realities create all this uncontrollable mess in the world? And, and you start by looking at your own life. You start by looking at what's going on in your life. And I like, you like to talk about on Monday, I love my life. On a Tuesday, I hate my life. What is that about? <laughs> what? <laughs> this is the same. It's the same. Can it life. be the other way yeah. around? Could it be? It could it be the other way around. Like Mondays suck, but the rest it of the week is be. awesome. <laughs> yeah, for a lot of people it is. Or I feel hopeful about the world on Wednesday, and on Thursday I feel like nothing's going to work. There's no point. Why are we even doing this? So I see how the world literally changes when I change. I look at my wife. And she, I will swear, she's a different wife day to day. But it's really me that's changing. She's nodding like, yeah, I am the same as you. And, so, and it's true. And it's like, <laughs> I look at my kids. And I look, so I've seen that when I shift, literally the world is different. So that, 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 that fact is really, really powerful and underappreciated. You know, yeah, you talk yeah. about... Um, <laughs> You talk about the fact that many of the things that humans have created uh, come back to sort of haunt us in the end. Um, I think we, I think it's probably worthwhile, Eric, talking about the fact that you are a former military man. Uh, our world is engulfed in conflict uh, at this particular time. Uh, you know, the, the word nuclear is on the table. These are all things that are man created. How does a fellow who was involved in the military and military intelligence, I understand. How do you then turn that around and sort of, you're not internalizing it, but what you're saying is, is that what we're seeing all comes through the prism of our own self. Yeah. Well, I got to, I got to share something very quickly in order to answer that because well, I, <clears throat> like most people, like I got into the military at a very young age, uh, and I w I wanted to. I I applied. You 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 can in Norway now. You can kind of like if you, if you want to go education route, you don't have to go. But I wanted to come, and I wanted to go in a specific direction. But I started training for it when I was like sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Then I got in at eighteen and nineteen, and then at nineteen twenty, I'm about to sign a contract that said like if we. If we tell you we've got to get deployed somewhere and no understanding of the macro um, kind of process that are going on in the world, no understanding of what's really going on, no understanding of the agendas of countries and collabor you know, collaborations of people. So I had a very simple, naive understanding of what was going on. That was my reality. That was my reality. I was like, I want this experience kind of more for me. And then I think we're going to do something that is helpful, but not seeing the whole picture. And when I, and then I was deployed, I was deployed to um, Afghanistan. And then I came out of that and I was like, this, to me, it was a, it was a, you know, a, a good experience, but it was also, you know, a bad experience. And it was a, a wake up call. It was like, what, what really makes things different and why are we even there and what's what's going on with this humans and what what's the backstory of all of this and how do we really make a change and you know all this like i was just filled with all these questions and so that kind of shifted my complete reality for what was going on to like a much bigger view and that helped me like understand and reorganize how i thought about the role of the military the role of all these things because my mind shifted and that's how you ended up doing what you're doing now. that's how i became fascinated about how how 
how does change really happen? Like, what, what's that about? Because I could see it when, when something worked over there, and I could see when it didn't work. And it was usually when we didn't consider other cultures, we didn't consider realities, we didn't cons consider people's well-being, we didn't consider listening, and listening is the same as understanding. And when that's not there, it doesn't really matter what you do. It's not going to be efficient, and in worst case, it's going to be destructive. So I saw that a lot of things that actually need to change are not being done. And it's, it's, it's the, the exact opposite. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I just want to, I, I need to really give a little backstory for, to understand the shift that happens and how at a certain age, you can't see that, or in a certain environment, you can't see that, but everyone can shift and everyone can change and see, and see a bigger picture. And then Eric and Mara, then, okay, so then that, shift occurred, which we're thrilled because you created one solution global. How did that come about? And can you explain or share a little bit more about that? Yeah. I mean, both of us in our own, you know, life journeys had become fascinated with this question of how do humans change? And, you know, Adik just gave a little bit of his backstory and, and mine was different. I wrote a whole book about it, so I won't get into it, but I, I just had a very personal experience within my family life where my dad changed and he was someone I didn't think could change or didn't expect to change. His personality was so large in my experience that the idea that it could become different was shocking to me. And so that sparked a curiosity in me of how does that happen for people? And to make a long story short, I spent the first about eight to 10 years of my career working with individuals and then in leadership and corporate settings, um, really focused on helping people understand what we're talking about in this podcast, that everything comes from the mind and that our state of mind is responsible for the state of the world. Well, initially it was, it's responsible for the state of your personal life or your family life or the culture of your company. But what became increasingly fascinating to me, and I came, I had a social work degree. I have always been very compelled just as a person to be of service and to help the most neglected people in society. Um, so I found myself working with, you know, very successful leaders and executives, which was really cool. And it taught me a lot. But I also was kind of questioning what is the connection between these leaders and these companies and how the world is run and then homelessness and poverty and war and refugee crisis and climate crisis. And, you know, if we can get, you know, extremely powerful, influential, wealthy leaders of the world to have massive shifts of heart and mind, how can we be taking that capability and applying it to some of these gnarly persistent global challenges that we're dealing with that don't seem to be getting much better even though we're having all these advances in technology and healthcare and all this other stuff and to me it looked like talking more explicitly about the mind was the missing piece it was the reason that we weren't gaining more traction on some of these big hairy issues so when we met and started um working together we kind of discovered that we both had this deeper question and longing inside of ourselves to say, hey, if, if I'm going to be alive for however long I'm going to be alive and I'm going to be in the field of human change, I want to be in it in whatever I can see to be the greatest contribution possible. And so that was when we decided to form One Solution, which really was initially just an idea. It was a name of a conference that we decided to host where we said, look, let's just see what happens if we try to bring people together who are working on some of these issues, people who are working with refugees, people who are working in third world countries that experience uh, corruption, people are working, or I should say developing nations that are experiencing corruption, um, people that are working on things like violence and poverty, and ask this question of how do we accelerate solutions by more consciously and directly trying to go to the source of it in the human mind. Um, and so that turned into the first conference that we had in Oslo, Norway in 2015 or 2016. 
Yeah, around that time. And then we had another conference in South Africa and then another one in Jerusalem, all in the span of a couple of years, um, which led us to just meeting people and talking more about this and eventually deciding to turn One Solution into its own nonprofit organization so that we could begin to do specific projects on the ground in these different places and, and fundraise for them um, <coughs> as a nonprofit. But it really was just, we called it a hypothesis for a while. like. And, and we're still in the process of understanding, exploring it and seeing if it holds water. But at the most basic level, what we're trying to see is if we help people feel bit better on the inside, can they do better on the outside in such a way that it creates change in the world so that individuals change, communities change, systems change. I just want to read you a little uh, quote here. Only through an inner spiritual transformation do we gain the strength to fight vigorously the evils of the world in a humble and loving spirit. That's um, a sermon by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that he gave uh, in the Ebenezer Baptist Church. So the only reason I read that really was because obviously someone like Dr. Martin Luther King um, had to overcome tremendous obstacles, and yet he always preached nonviolence. He always preached love. And my question to you is that, so what results have come from that? Has anything concrete come? From a message such as that, does the world change from within? Hmm. I mean, in his case, I would definitely say, and I would say, love, that feeling, that energy is, the core of it is actually before fixing it, it's the biggest preventative force. And it's hard to measure if something didn't happen um, because of this energy of this. To if someone's a very specific example, if someone's able to de- de-escalate something before it even becomes something, it's like it never existed. We are usually measuring things whether somebody already did something, and you were able to then solve it. So I would say the biggest strength of that energy of bringing that into the world is preventative and it's making sh- making sure that that force is driving good stuff in the world. That being said, I also think it solves things. It heals. It heals like love and listening and openness and understanding heals things that 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 have been broken it heals divisiveness. It, 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 one person brings that energy and the other one does. That, that person, if it sticks to it, will be able to reach that, that other person. So I would say that now. That's because my eyes see that all the time. So, but I would say, yes, I would say prevention and creation of, of, a, of a world where we have less than we would have if we didn't have that. And then healing and fixing and solving and intervening on things that are messed up right now. <laughs> I would say 100%. I'd also add, I think um, one of the cool parallels that I've seen between how an individual is the same as the whole world is that when I've worked with people who, um, just to put a generic term on it, have an enormous amount of sort of conflict and turmoil and dis-ease in their life. And that manifests in so many different ways. You know, they might have destructive habits like addictions. They have relationship issues. Um, maybe they've had multiple divorces or they, they, they've had a falling out with their children. So and on an individual level, you can see how inner turmoil creates outer turmoil. And one thing that I've noticed is that when people have 
an awakening, a realization, a shift in consciousness where they suddenly see from within how they have been the source of the turmoil in their life. And they have this aha moment. They have this massive shift. And a lot of those behaviors uh, fall away or get better. Or to Adik's point, they suddenly, from that new level of consciousness, prevent you know, future things that could have happened that they don't even know about had they stayed in that state of turmoil. But there's this interesting period that often happens with people I work with, and I've seen it in myself too, is that suddenly when you get clearer eyes for how you're going about life and and how you're the source of things, there's this kind of, excuse my language, but like, oh shit, period. (laughs) I didn't see, you know, prior to their own realization, often it looks like, well, lots of bad stuff has happened to me in life, or why is my life so hard, or these people are so difficult. And so there's this kind of like, oh, crap period that they go through where they see so much of the stuff that they've been doing that isn't working. And then this healing process kind of begins. And I sometimes feel, and this is just my own personal opinion, like we're sort of in that collective consciousness awakening process right now. I feel like we're waking up to so many of the stuff we've been doing, whether it's inequality and racism or absolute greed and destruction of the environment. We're seeing so many things that we've been a party to that we didn't realize we were participants in, that we didn't realize were coming from us. And we're having this kind of like, oh crap moment on a collective level. And so I think, you know, to your point, like, do people really change? Is there just always going to be this awful stuff that we create in the world? No, I really do think there is change underway. I do think that there's a massive shift going on, but I do feel a bit, and again, this is just my opinion, that we're, uh, we're kind of in that oh crap moment where we're seeing a lot of it. And so it feels at times like it's really bad, but we're seeing things that we didn't see before. We're realizing invisible things we're participating in that, that we did not know we were participating in any in the past, and now we know. And so there's this this period that can be quite brutal um, and a bit painful, but I think ultimately it's a good thing. And yet, actually, Mara, to that point, this is very interesting because one uh, example in particular that really um, sparked me was you, I don't know how long ago this was, but you spoke to high school students where you talked about a superpower and um, you created a really huge aha moment for many in the audience. And one particular person comes to mind who is actually going to be on our uh, podcast next week is Dijon White, who created mm-hmm. Rebels for Peace because of your talk, because of that that um, wave that you created of inspiration. Can you share what that superpower was? Like, what is it? Yeah, I mean, in that talk, there's so many ways people have talked about this for thousands of years since the dawn of human beings. But in that moment, I just asked myself, how would I talk to my teenage self about the power of the mind. And that was when I decided to call it a superpower. And all I wanted to inspire for them was the realization that my mind is my own and it's free. And Hmm. that leads to so many things in life that become possible when you know that, that don't seem possible when you don't know that, which is why it feels like a superpower. Like when I realized that, that was a massive revelation for me. It's like, oh, so my teachers don't own my mind. My parents don't own my mind. Society doesn't own my mind. Like my mind is my own and it's free. Wow. Like I could do anything with that. And, and that was, yeah, that was the inspiration for me in, in calling it that for that group of young people in that moment. It's kind of like, uh, it's like, fresh air blowing <laughs> yeah. through your head. <laughs> I mean, really. But I have to ask you this, especially, again, because of the times that we're living in. I have two words for you, uh, Eric. Um, fear and mm-hmm. trust. Those are two things in our world that are very prominent. Fear and the lack of trust. 
how do you not be taken as someone who's perhaps a bit naive with your way of thinking along these lines? How do you win over Vladimir Putin? Just to raise the <laughs> well, bar a little that's bit. That's a different question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a whole different question. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, we don't have another half hour. So let's just... Well, I would say... Um, it was, it was in our society, is kind of based on fear. Yeah. I mean, the thing that comes to mind, and we talk about this ad nauseum, but we talk about listening. Okay. And listening is not just like an, 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 uh, something like with your ears. It's really like an opening our perception to be able to hold more of reality and see more of what is really going on with less noise and less stories. Okay. Now, what you might see when you have less on it might be beautiful things but it also might be things that are really horrible things that are that are going on that are actually really really bad and troubling that are going on into the world and that's true that's there's beautiful things amazing things happening and there's horrible things happening the fear part and the the thing that we do on top of that is it's like a layer above real experience. It's, it's, it's an, an, an adding of stories. And that's where I start to feel. And the, the b- biggest barometer is if you start to feel chronically, where you over time you live in a feeling rather than it visits you, I know there's, there's a layer of stories happening. There's, there's something that I'm continuing to do that is adding on to the whole of reality and that's where i feel like the biggest thing you have to reach people with is first lead with listening and let go of your own stories your own ideas and then hopeful when you do that they might start to do the same and that's how i would do with vladimir putin i would i would try to let go of many things as i could and be completely open and just use anything I can to find new and interesting ways to reach his heart, which you have to let go of things in order to do. Mm-hmm. So that's what we're not willing to do. We are willing to, mm-hmm. to blame. Um, but blame is not neutral. You can just say this action is wrong. But after that, the opportunity to humans had is to, to completely listen and then get new ideas how to reach the hearts and minds of all these leaders, how to reach the hearts and minds of people, and feel all the feelings. Feel the hope, feel the despair, like we would do this with a three-year-old. Feel happiness, feel your tantrum. That's totally okay. We're supposed to feel. We're part of the world. Like We are in this world, and when there's killings happening, you feel that. Like That's, that's humanness, but we don't want to live in fear you don't want to live in everything that comes beyond that real and human experience and that's where we can really help each other that's where we can really see more about that so i don't know if that answered your 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 question but that that being able to be in that uncertainty and being that fear without letting it run you and take over and and i guess to that point then uh this is a nice segue into our show is called Believe in People. And why yeah. do you both believe in people? I can't help it. I feel like I was born believing <laughs> people. And then- Way more than I was. <laughs> <laughs> I had to, I had to <laughs> believe that. No, but you know what I mean. Yeah. No, but I, I think it's like the life force I talked about. I think, you know, when I look at our, our three-year-old and our one-year-old, I see they believe in everything in the most magical free way. And it, it's those stories that you just referenced that, that we build up and we, we get ideas of things to be afraid of and to be fearful of people and, and cultures and ideas and systems. And, and it, it becomes very messy, but underneath all of that, um, I think everyone 
um, is the life force, is love, wants to feel that life energy and wants to feel that love. And so it's our job to just help people heal back, get out from under, dissolve the unhelpful story so that they can feel that. So I believe in people because I've always felt it. And I think that it is, um, it's not something we have to create. I think it's something that's already there. And it's just a matter of operating in life and with people and in the world in a way where you know that. And so you're looking for it, you're mining for it. And then lo and behold, it, it shows up and it just reinforces that feeling in me. So I feel like why else be alive if you can't believe in people? <laughs> <laughs> Eric, yeah, I, waiting for you. Well, I would just say that um, I've felt the power of being believed in, like that, and that's a very human relational thing. But sometimes pe- people are so used they don't we don't believe in ourselves, you know. And and when you believe in someone, you're not giving them something, but you helping them realize that they they can believe in themselves, and that is a gift. That is a gift that I've received from other people. I can see their eyes that like, not with their words, but like, they, they believe in me. And that does something. I become that. I want to like, oh, I'm worth something. I can do something. I'm okay. Like, I'm a good person. Maybe I can do that. And then when I've done that with other people, they have that same, sometimes like, they get like, what? What? I can do something? And we must, especially young people, if they just are with someone that you can, and they, you believe in them because most people don't believe it. Maybe their family or schools, the system, blah, blah, blah. It's all noise. So if you can be that person that believes in them, it can change the trajectory of their whole life. So it's a, it's a huge, it's a gift. That's how we would describe it. And I've received it and it, it, you could give it infinitely. There's no you know, lack of it. You can believe in, in everyone. So you can just keep, keep giving it. Myra and Eric, thank you so much for sharing your gift with us. Thank you. It was an honor. Thank you so much. It it was such a pleasure. Thank you. You know, my takeaway from this conversation isn't so much that that change comes within, because I think that, you know, most of us probably know that, but the the whole notion that, that your mind is actually yours and it's free and it belongs to you, um, I actually, that was quite inspiring. That's, that, that kind of really inspired me. It's mine. Exactly. And Kevin, to that point, actually. So when I heard Mara, she did a talk on that and about your mind is your own and free. Because no one, unless you allow somebody to um, trigger something or affect you in a certain way, you have to l- allow that. So, it, so yeah, your brain, your mind is your own and it's very freeing to know that, that you have a choice. And so yes. they're doing, they, the fact that the one solution is, is doing good in the world and they're trying and they're collaborating with so many different organizations. I, I believe that they really are creating this exciting movement that's going to um, build momentum and, uh, and they're, they're on the right track. And if you found this conversation interesting, Perhaps you freed up your mind for a half an hour. Then uh, join us next week uh, for another another episode of uh, Believe in People. Or, of course, you can subscribe. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.